I would like to open today in uh, Matthew chapter 6, and I would like to read to you verse uh, 33 and following. What To give you the setting of this, Jesus has been talking both to his disciples and to uh, to the crowds, and he's been talking about uh, our worries and our anxieties, and how we tend to to worry about what's going to come in the future, and how we're going to we worry about the past, and how what we're going to wear, and all those kinds of things. And so he's kind of talking about flowers and what flowers think about and what birds think about and all those kinds of things and their trust in God and how God provides for them. Um, And then in verse 33, he says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, speaking of God, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own, as we well know. Now, Jesus is always trying to do something, I think, for all of the people following him. And that is to get them to be in the moment. To, to not be so preoccupied with the past and the future. But to actually be aware of the very moment that they're in. Um, and to deal with the worries and the anxieties and the things that they have in the moment. But his encouragement in that context is to seek his kingdom instead of kind of getting wrapped up in all of those things. And so he says, look, if you will seek the kingdom of God, then everything that you usually worry about will be added unto you. But not necessarily not like the way that we all hope it will all the time. But, but God is going to take care of you. That's not the thing you need to be worried about. But the problem is, is that you and I end up in places of worry all the time. We end up in places of worry when we are trying to figure out, like, which snack food we need to eat, right? Is it going to be Takis or Doritos? Like, this is our worry. Like, we have that anxiety. Uh, that produces worry. But in a more serious sense, all of us face crises and, and anxieties all the time. When it comes to the way our husband spoke to us in the morning, to the way our child is throwing a fit or being distracting, or the way that you know your job is going and the amount of money you're making for as hard as you're working. Like you, you end up with all these anxieties and worries. And the things that kind of come out of that, there are three things that I think kind of overarchingly are just always present in our life. Number one, there are many, many situations where you and I just feel like we're foolish. Right? We feel like we don't have the answer we need to have. We don't know how we're supposed to deal with the issues inside of us, and we certainly don't know how we're supposed to deal with our wives. And we don't know how we're supposed to deal with our children who seem after discipline, after discipline, after discipline to go do the exact same thing, Right? And we're like, and so in some ways we feel foolish because we're like, we should know how to do this, but we don't, right? So we often feel foolish. You all have had that caught in the deer light, in the headlights, you know, thing where, you know, kind of like a deer caught in the headlights. That's the phrase. Anyway, the other way that we end up feeling is in the midst of our anxiety is that we feel weak. What I mean by weak is that we have internal processes in us where we're like, I, I want to not be thinking these things and I want to not be doing these things and I want to not think about what my dad said to me when I was five years old that determined so much about me, right? Or the offhand comment my teacher gave me in seventh grade. Like, or, you know, we have these things that just kind of circle in our head and we feel weak. Or the, the, the culture keeps telling us that this is what makes you beautiful. This is what makes you strong. This is who, you know, how the world should be. And we feel like we can't resist all of these value statements. And so we feel very often weak. We feel foolish. We feel weak. If it's not that, then we feel like our voice has no impact, Right? Like, we have good things to say, but nobody wants to listen to us. 
we are trying to communicate to our friends how we feel, and yet they don't seem to care or it doesn't seem to have an impact on them. They're not listening to us. They have no compassion on us. They don't care what we have to say. Right? So, so very often, where we find ourselves is feeling foolish, feeling weak, and feeling like we have no impact or helpless. And we, find, we find ourselves caught in those situations with no real way out. And, and the funny thing is, is that I make the joke about Doritos and, and talkies, but we live in an individual, you know, intellectualistic culture that, that means that, tells us that choice is important, and yet choice becomes so overwhelming to us that we feel like, oh my gosh, you know, like we, we can't even deal with all the choices. So I may, may you may make a joke about that, but it's a reality. Now, there was a king, and that king's name is Nebuchadnezzar, or a ruler, and he ruled Babylon. And, and before Babylon, there was only one ancient superpower, and that was Assyria. It was the first one. And after Assyria was Babylon. And Babylon took over Assyria, and they were one of the most powerful, um, well, they were the most powerful country, were, you know, society and this guy named Nebuchadnezzar was the king and even though the king has all of this supposed power he's just like you and I that somehow power and authority and supposed wisdom does not fix things for you when you're sleeping at night and you have dreams right and so chapter 2 of the book of Daniel says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. Now I know all of you, including myself, have experienced this. You know, where you're laying flat on your back, staring at the ceiling, and all you can think about is what's going to happen tomorrow and how tired you're going to be in the morning because you can't sleep. But also, it seems that you maybe are drifting in and out of dreams, and these dreams seem relatively vivid, and they seem that they might be important to you. Well, that's because you're stressed out. And anytime you're stressed out, you have dreams that trouble you, and you can't sleep, right? And, and in some ways, those dreams, maybe they don't make you feel foolish, but they certainly will make you feel weak, will make you feel like you have no way of really knowing the answer, because somehow you can't impact the, the future tomorrow while you lay there staring at the ceiling, wondering what the meaning of life is, right? Well, that's where Daniel Nebuchadnezzar is, right? And so Nebuchadnezzar has a few more ways of solving things other than just taking way too much melatonin, right? What he decides to do is he decides to call in all of his head, not just the minor people. He said, I don't care about them. I want all the big wig, you know, astrologers and magicians, the ones that I have, have trained, I want them to come in and answer my dream for me and tell me what it means. And so they all come in and like good con men, because that's what they are, they say, well, if you tell us what your dream is, we'll tell you the meaning, which is something all of you can do. And in the morning service, I, I asked this, I thought, well, maybe there's an app for it now. And I said that jokingly, and then I got a text with the app, the picture of the app, the Christian dream interpreting app. So it's there. So Nebuchadnezzar could have just typed it into his app, but he didn't have that, so he had to get the magicians. The magicians weren't there. This is interesting. What they said was, look, like the only one who can tell you actually what your dream is is the gods, because the gods know the minds of of the people, but they don't share their mind with us and they don't walk amongst us. Like, so they don't have relationship with us and they keep that secret. So we can't tell you what the dream is. And he's like, I really need to know what this is. So you have to tell me what the dream is so I can trust your interpretation because I really need to know because it's that troubling. And they're like, well, King, you asked for something impossible. And so he says, fine. I'm going to kill you all because what good are you to me other than you're just taking advantage of me, right? I'm just going to kill you, which I don't know how many Old Testament stories you've read, but this seems to be a common solution when you don't get what you want is to kill people. This is, this is kind of the way the Old Testament characters live out their lives, especially ones in power. But it also is important for us to note that when you and I find ourselves in a place where we feel foolish, so 
just like caught in the headlights or we feel like we don't have power or we feel like we don't have authority, we do stupid things, right? We make foolish choices because what we're trying to do is somehow grab control and get some kind of satisfaction to the unsettled waters, you know, or the boat that's in the waves that we're trying to balance ourselves on. So we do something stupid. Now for Nebuchadnezzar who has power, he decides to get rid of people. He decides to get rid of people. All right. So in verse 14 of chapter 2, it says, When Archaeoch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel. If you didn't know, we are in the Daniel Project. Oh. Oh. Well, anyway. <laughs> We're in the Daniel project. And, and, and Daniel find, the story of Daniel finds itself in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is the story of Israel, a nation who was called out by God and its relationship with God. Okay? And the New Testament is the story of Jesus and the church, God's people called out. So just for a, a simple way of understanding our story, when we think about Daniel, and we think about Israel, you can just think about Israel as the church, right? It's a good way to understand it in the sense of it's a way, it's a people called out relating to God. Different purposes and different trajectory, but it's a good way to think about it. Now, Daniel is near the end of Israel's kind of importance in some ways within the Old Testament in that Israel has been completely wiped out, except for a few dudes hanging out in Jerusalem that's not really much there um, because they've been called into exile, right? So Daniel is a story about the people of God being in exile. And what we have found in chapter 1 is that, or at least for last week, we work our ways backwards, is that Daniel is a man of risk. He's willing at the right moments to risk in order to honor God, right? Right? But not only that, the other thing about Daniel is it seems that he's not just willing to risk, he is constantly looking for the open door. He really kind of understands what Jesus talks about in Matthew and that he's looking for the moments and the places where God is acting and then he's stepping through those doors and taking risks. But he's doing it in a very calculated way. Right? In a couple uh, sermons we uh, earlier we talked about how Daniel takes a moment when he he's fine learning all about the magic and all the Babylonian way of life but when it came to food he's like here's a moment where I can stand out we're going to be different here and so he tr- he asks well can we eat vegetables and drink water he takes a moment to stand out to be different in order to demonstrate God's power Well, Daniel, again, needs to act. It says, Daniel spoke to him, that's the guard, with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Archiach then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Now, I'm going to say that this is one of those moments when Daniel probably felt exactly what you and I would feel. Daniel doesn't know what's going on. So at at the moment that he's finding out he's going to be executed, he doesn't even know why he's being executed. Here's a deer caught in the headlights. Why do you want to kill me? Right? He he has to feel at some level foolish in that, like, why doesn't he know what's going on? He also has to, I mean, it's Daniel against the Babylonian Empire. So he has to at some level feel powerless. And what authority does he really have to stop things. He probably feels relatively helpless. And yet, even though he may have those experiences, he doesn't act that way. Number one, he, it says he uses wisdom and tact. Right? So he acts in wisdom. Even though he may have felt foolish or like kind of caught off guard, he acts with wisdom and he finds out what's going on. Right? Why are you trying to kill me? And he does it very carefully so he can find out. But as soon as he finds out, what does he do? He marches right into the throne room and asks for time. He just marches right in. So he believes that he has some level of authority, even though, 
I don't know what authority he really has. Yeah, what's the worst that can happen, right? He's going to get killed. He walks in there. But not only that, he asks for time because he believes that he has some connection to power, right? That he has a power to interpret dreams. He has the capacity. Somehow he's going to be able to do that. Now, there's some reasons for this. The reason, first reason that Daniel acts this way is in the earlier chapter, verse 2 of chapter 1. It says, that Daniel says that God gave Judah to Nebuchadnezzar. God gave Jerusalem to Nebuchadnezzar. This is the operating principle of Daniel, that even though he might be in exile and Nebuchadnezzar might be king, he's not Daniel's ruler. He's just the one in authority at the moment. But God is the one who's acting. And so Daniel is always looking for God to act. So that's number one. Number two, it says, Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed when the rest of the wise men of, with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. So the second thing Daniel understands, and I think this is important for you and I too, is that he understands that he's not alone. It's not just him. Like he goes to his friends, right? And we're going to find out in this chapter that he really, really likes these guys. These are his buddies. And he knows that they're going to be by his side. So he's not alone. I think this is key for us to understand. From Daniel. Number one, we, we have to operate as people who understand that God is in control, regardless of what's going on around us. And that God is still acting in all things, regardless of what's going on. But number two, as we experience the roughness of life, as we experience the feelings of foolishness and not having, like being helpless and feeling powerless, that we're not alone. We have uh, Azariah and Hananiah and, and Michelle. Like we have people with us who are walking alongside us. We have people. We are not alone, right? We have people. We're not alone. But there's one other thing that Daniel understands. He understands that God's in charge. He understands they're not alone. But he understands that the God of the heavens is not the Babylonian gods. What is it that the astrologers say? They say, who knows the mind of the gods? They don't share it with us. Like, they don't even walk amongst us. They're like, they don't care about us. But what does Daniel say? Daniel says, let's go and let's pray that God will show his mercy to us and reveal to us what is needed so that we can interpret the dream and know what the dream is. Now, mercy is, the, is this idea of, of God's love being poured out in one direction in a continual stream that cannot be stopped. So what they're asking is, God, will you reveal what you're thinking in your mind? Will you pour out your love on us in this moment of crisis? So there's a belief with Daniel that God will engage and relate and have relationship with people who say, we need your help. They actually believe that God cares about them, that God's involved with them, that God is interested and active in what's going on. For ancient people, that's a radical idea. Like you and I as followers of Jesus are like, yeah, that makes sense. No, no, no. For them, that, like, these are a small group of people who believe this. Everyone else thinks the gods are crazy. Right? Good movie, too. Um, they might be. Um, so, God reveals the dream, and then Daniel kind of reveals his theology in a prayer, his way of understanding God. He says, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. Right? So, how does Daniel act with wisdom? He knows that God has wisdom to give. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. So he has the power to change the seasons. He can set up kings and presidents and rulers, and he can take them down. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. 
I thank and praise you, O Lord of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. As you and I, as we wrestle to follow Jesus and struggle with this feel of feelings of feeling, you know, foolish and weak and helpless, which is something all of us feel a lot. I mean, I have felt that way today, right? Just moments before when I came to stand up here, I felt a little foolish and like, what do I have to say, right? We all have these experiences, but the invitation of Daniel is to walk shoulder to shoulder with him in this world, saying, God gives wisdom, God gives power, God, in that, gives us authority. Like, the, the, if we are willing to step into relationship with him and ask for it, he's going to show up. And even though we might feel afraid, even though we might feel foolish, even though we might feel like we don't have the words to say, God will show up. And so Daniel invites us to walk alongside him in that. But I want to talk a little bit about what maybe in the New Testament, Paul invites us into and hopefully get you excited about what you and I have. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul speaks to both, and Paul is, is an apostle, you know, so theoretically, the creed we say is partly his. Um, and when Paul hears the faith of the Ephesians, which would include you, in the future, Paul prays. So this prayer isn't just for the Ephesians. This is a prayer for you. And so chapter 1 of Ephesians, which is a letter he wrote to the Ephesians, starting in verse 15, he has a prayer. And he says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the glorious Father may give you the Spirit, and that's capital S, the Holy Spirit, of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Here's what, what's interesting. is the prayer that Paul prays for you and I is that we might have revelation and that we might have wisdom in order that we might have intimacy with God. That, that's what, what's crazy is, is that Daniel believed that God was going to show up because he had intimacy with God. The reason that he had intimacy with God is because he understood how he acted and what he was doing because God had revealed that to him over and over and he could look back to the vegetable story. He could look back to the probably the countless stories of journeying to Babylon and all that he had to face where God showed up over and over again. What Paul is asking God to do is open your eyes and my eyes and give us wisdom and revelation so that we might have intimacy with God. If you want to combat your foolish feelings and your, the powerlessness and helplessness that you experience, Right? then the prayer that you want to call on God for is revelation and wisdom in order that you might have intimacy with him because when you have intimacy with God, you will reflexively act because you believe God's going to show up. Because when you walk with God, you know how much he loves you and how willing he is to show up when you act with wisdom and power and authority. Okay? But Paul kind of ex explains how he can do this and how Daniel is able to do it in some ways. When he says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I love this because here is what your inheritance is. It's not going to heaven. That's going to be great when the kingdom of God comes to earth. I'm excited about that when all things are made new. It's beautiful. But you know what your inheritance is and you get to taste it right now? It's these people right here, right? Rose is your inheritance. <laughs> Carrick is also your inheritance, right? 
No, but I, I, I think this is important because Paul is saying the place, and we're going to see this, but the place that where you and I can get hold, grab hold of wisdom and power and authority is in our inheritance. Because listen, listen to what, what, he, what he says. And after the inheritance of the saints and his incomparably great power for us, that would be the church, who believe that pow- that power is like the work of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, every title that can be given not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So, the church is your inheritance, and the church is the place where God's power is demonstrated, and the church is where fullness is found. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has fallen on the people of the church. So, so often you and I get caught up in, in your anxieties when you feel foolish, weak, and, and, and without any, and helpless. What you do is you're saying, like, look, like, I have this individual relationship with Jesus, and I don't feel filled full. But that doesn't mean the church isn't full. The problem is, is that you are so caught up in you that you don't realize that your inheritance is full and you can participate in it and be part of it. So, so here's what I mean by this. When, you, when Daniel, in some ways, I mean, Daniel is, is the pre-church, Israel, but, but when Daniel faces these moments of crisis with his friends, he knows that in some sense, his power and his wisdom and his might come from his friends who lay down their hearts before God together. When you face, you know, and we'll say it from the funny place, when you you face Doritos or Takis, your wisdom, power, and strength come because of the church. Like you can make a good decision there because of the wisdom of the church. But, but here's the thing. When you find yourself caught in the headlights in your relationship with your, with your, wife or your husband or your kids, where you feel powerless, where you're feeling like you're helpless in things, like those are legit feelings, but you can act with wisdom and you can act with power and you can act with authority in those places when you understand that Rose is your inheritance. She's behind you and she has the spirit of God, right? That that this community, well, she's in front of you right now, this, this community has the Spirit of God. And together, we have wisdom. And together, we have power. And together, we have authority because it's been given to the church and that power is the power that raised Christ and the Spirit has fallen on us. Now, Daniel has the dream revealed to him. And uh, this is a really long chapter, so I'm going to tell you what the dream is, and then I'm going to read the interpretation. So Daniel marches in to Nebuchadnezzar, and, and what's interesting is here, as you'll notice this, and I'll point it out when we read it, is that Daniel is not, he's pretty keen on the idea that God did not just give it, like he's not the one. It's not, he didn't figure this out on his own. And on top of that, it was something that was given to him as a community, and we'll see that. But he tells Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was, and the basic gist of the dream is this. There's this statue that Nebuchadnezzar sees, and the statue's head is made of gold, and its torso and arms are made of silver, and its waist is made of bronze, and its legs are made of iron, and its feet are made of iron kind of streaming out into clay. And all of a sudden, a big old boulder, hewn, not by human hands, comes flying in and crushes the statue. And the wind blows the statue to the four corners of the earth, and the mountain devours the earth. It just consumes the earth. Right? And so that's the dream. Well, that seems like, I guess that would be, a, if I had a dream like that, I'd be like, well, that's weird, and move on. But that was not for, not for Nebuchadnezzar. And so Daniel walks in, and here's what Daniel says in verse 36. This was the dream, and now we... Not I, 
but now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will rise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything, and iron, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be the divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than the iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and will bring them to an and end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that was that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to the him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all the wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request... The king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Now to work backwards, Nebuchadnezzar is pretty amazed and pretty shocked by Daniel's action, and he basically gives him the kingdom in some ways. This is the first time we meet Nebuchadnezzar, and the next two chapters are going to be sort of Nebuchadnezzar's conversion. He goes from meeting God to going crazy. That's kind of his story, to coming back to his senses. Um, But what's interesting here is that Daniel doesn't leave his friends behind. The people that he laid on his face with, he said, no, 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 they need to come with me because we're doing this together, right? So Daniel interprets the dream. And, you know, I, I grew up in church, so I've heard many explanations of all this. And I did a whole bunch of studying, as I said in the earlier service, probably more research than I should have, um, as to what the statue really means, because people have lots and lots of opinions about it all. But there is one very true prophet, like interpretation here, and that is that Nebuchadnezzar is the gold head. We know that for sure, right? And most likely then we understand that the silver is the Persians and the Medes. And then we understand that below that is the bronze, and that is the Greeks or it's Alexander the Great. And we know from Josephus that at least that's what the Jewish people believe because they came out and met Alexander and said, look, you're in this, you're in it. This is you. You're the bronze part of the statue. And he was so excited about that that he left Jerusalem alone and he worshiped there and moved on and didn't destroy them. We don't know if that's actually true because of the way Josephus writes. That may or may not have been true. Um, but it's interesting. We think, many people think, that then the iron is the Roman Empire because it crushed everything and is probably one of the most powerful empires ever to exist. And it still exists, which is an interesting thing, but it's fractured. (laughs) And others interpret the clay feet and the the iron to be the, the, the Moors and the Muslims. Who knows? Here's what I know, and which is really exciting, is that a big old rock crushes the statues. And a kingdom is established that's not established by human hands. So what might that be? I don't know. Um, Matthew 18 will tell you at some level what that might be. Because Jesus, 
and an encounter with with Peter that I think probably sometimes is misunderstood uh, says this in Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 he renames Peter the apostle and he says and I tell you you are Peter and on this rock I don't even though Peter means rock I don't think he's actually saying Peter you're the rock of the church it seems like in the text he's saying, and on this rock, so whoever that rock is. He, he's making kind of a metaphor here. He says, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned them, warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. What, what Jesus is saying is the church is the rock. Christ and the church are what crush kingdoms. And eventually, when Christ returns, it is what will overwhelm all kingdoms. But for right now, you and I are part of the rock that crushes kingdoms. That no kingdom, no, you know, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, no, you know, you put the ruler, despot, country, whatever you want. None of them can stop the church. Someone could come in here and wipe us all out and they cannot stop the church. The church cannot be stopped because what you and I bind on earth is bound in heaven and whatever we loose here is loosed in heaven. You and I have been given wisdom and power and authority. That's powerful. Like, so when we're in those moments of anxiety, when we're in those moments where we feel foolish and afraid and when we feel like we don't have power and we don't have authority, I want you to remember that the village is a tiny little part of a 2,000-year-old a community of people where the Spirit has fallen on us and we have wisdom and power and authority. But it's not for us to go out on our own. The way that we begin to understand God and have 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 all of these elements within our life and be able to act reflexively in our lives in those moments of feeling foolish, helpless, powerless, right? Is when we as a community are able to seek God's face. When we as a community are able to call this down, right? Because what happens with Daniel and Paul in these two passages we've read? Well, they're praying, when they're in a moment of a crisis, they go and ask for God's mercy. What is Paul asking for us? He wants us to have revelation. He wants us to understand the power we have. He's not trying to make it happen. He's asking God to reveal it to us. But you and I are good Americans and good modernists, and we believe that we should make all these things happen, that I should figure out how to have wisdom, and I should figure out how to have power and authority. And God says, no, no, let me just give it to you. No, i got to figure it out. No, let me just give it to you. So I would like you to, to think, to imagine with me, what your life would be like if you were able to act with wisdom and tact, if you were able to act with authority and power when you choose your Doritos, right? I love that, right? Because I could get you all the groan. Um, but but I, it's because I want your attention because imagine what it would be like if you could act in the places that you know in your heart right now you're afraid or frustrated or feel foolish and powerless and can't overcome. What it would be like if you could act with wisdom, power, and authority. Well, Daniel's invitation to us is to be able to recognize these moments of crisis step through, actually put God kind of on notice in a way. See, Daniel could have just said, fine, here's my head, chop it off. I don't care, right? But no, Daniel walked into the throne room, said, give me time, I'm going to figure this out. He believed that God was going to come through. Maybe God wasn't going to reveal the dream, but he knew that God was going to do something. You and I have lost that, I think in so many ways. So we don't believe God's going to do something, right? Or he's not going to do what we want him to do. So why, you know, he's not going to come through and remove the foolishness in our heart, like the feeling of just feeling 
foolish. He's not going to make us feel like really strong. He's not going to give us that commanding voice of Rod. We're not going to get those things. So we'll just cower. But I would ask you, okay, well, let's imagine what it would look like as a people if we had that. What would happen? What would it be like? I think Daniel is inviting us to think about those things. Now, I looked at my my talk, and it started at 5.40, so I've been speaking for 43 minutes, um, which is long for me, Uh, except it may be early in the village when I would speak for an hour. But, um, (laughs) but, you know, we didn't have kids in those days. so I'll, if, if anybody has any response, like we got to make it short, but if you have something you want to say, respond to what I've said. This is your moment to, to respond. Um, if not, then we'll pray. Thoughts, questions, responses? All right, I know you all want peppered beef. I understand how this works. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, let's let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, in the midst of when I feel foolish and in the midst of when I feel powerless and when I feel like I don't have authority, I would ask that you would remind me to grab hold of, of my community, to know that you have fallen on us. Your spirit is with us. And we have your power and your wisdom and your authority to speak what is true, to step into really scary places into our lives, to be okay to make mistakes and to expect you to show up. Um, So I ask that you give me the courage to do that and my community to do that. And ask that in your holy name. Amen.